Welcome to St. Luke's Virtual Worship on, for August 2nd, 2020. I'd like to welcome you from wherever you're coming from, from, from uh, your virtual space. I hope that your vacations are going well and you're getting lots of time for rest. I'm getting time for rest too, because although it looks like I'm doing your Sunday service today, in fact, this is pre-recorded from the month of July, and I am in fact on vacation this week and for the next few weeks. Um, and uh, so if you're looking for pastoral care or for any concerns, just call the church office and, uh, and they can connect you to the right people. I want to mention as well that um, this week, starting on the 4th of August, we are going to be doing a virtual vacation Bible school this, this year at St. Luke's. The idea is for the next four, uh, four weeks, um, we're, on Tuesdays we're going to be releasing some activities um, for kids and youth to participate in. On Wednesday, on our Facebook page, there is going to be a meditation practice that goes along with the theme of each week. And it's not just for kids, it's for everybody. Um, so if you are a grown-up and would like to participate in our Vacation Bible School, the meditations are right there. And also the activities, there's going to be a pointer to that in the church at, week, uh, the church at work also coming out each Wednesday. And then um, for those who have signed up, and you have to sign up with the office for this, there will be a Zoom call for the kids on Thursdays. If you would like to participate in this, it's not too late to sign up. Just um, contact the office um, by Tuesday or when, uh, before Thursday, and you should be able to get the package and all the information you need. Let's center our hearts and minds and be ready to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church today. The light of Christ be with you. Hear the sound calling us to prayer. We pray together. Give me a candle of the Spirit, O God, as I go down into the depths of my being. Show me the hidden things, the creatures of my dreams, the storehouse of forgotten memories and hurts. Take me down to the spring of my life and tell me my nature and my name. Give me freedom to grow so that I may become that self, the seed of which you planted in me at my making. Out of the depths I cry to you, O God. Amen.
Our scripture today comes from the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, starting at chapter, chapter 4, verse 16, and reading through to chapter 5, verse 10. So we do not lose heart. Even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, longing to be clothed with our heavenly dwelling, if indeed, when we have taken it off, we will not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan under our burden, because we wish not to be unclothed, but to be further clothed, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, even though we know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. Yes, we do have confidence, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For all of us must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each may receive recompense for what has been done in the body, whether good or evil. This is the word of God. When I was in theological school, it was fashionable to dump on the Apostle Paul. We were all in our first flush of discovering feminist theology and a way of understanding the Bible from women's perspective. And when we read Paul, man, it was just like going back into the dark ages. Some of the things he had to say about women were truly awful. It's because of things that Paul said that I still have to, from time to time, defend my right to be a woman preacher. And I also have I also have compassion for members of the LGBTQ plus community who have over the years had to defend themselves from ac hurtful accusations laid out by Paul in the letter to Romans and in the letter um, to the, fir uh, the first letter to the Corinthians. Jesus had nothing to say about women in leadership except to include women amongst his disciples. And he had nothing at all to say about the LGBTQ plus community. All of this heat and light in these issues in our 21st century church come from things that Paul said and from those Christians who cherry pick the least inclusive things that Paul said in order to support their own exclusive positions. I don't want to let Paul off the hook here, but sometimes I think for those of us who count ourselves as progressive and liberal Christians, our bigger issue is not even just the exclusive things that from time to time Paul says. But the bigger challenge is the style of Paul's faith. He believes fervently that Jesus is coming back any day now. That what is going to happen is we are going to be leaving these physical bodies and receiving new spiritual bodies that look like the body that Jesus received after the resurrection. You might remember that body acted a little bit differently. Sometimes you could recognize him and sometimes you couldn't. He could walk through walls and still yet eat fish when he got there. He appeared and disappeared at will in front of people's eyes. So Paul imagined that all of us would be given resurrection bodies and then we would go live in the new city of the new Jerusalem, in the new creation, where death was no more, where tears and sighing were, were past things where there was no violence but only justice, and all were equal in that city with all those who believed and claimed, uh, claimed their place, living in harmony just as Adam and Eve did for those first days in the Garden of Eden. The 
problem with this vision is that Jesus did not come back. It's been 2,000 years now, less about 10 years, and we've been waiting all that time for Jesus to return. More and more, I am starting to think that Jesus never taught his disciples that he would return. Just like he never taught his disciples that he would be king. He did teach about the kingdom of God that is already here on earth, living inside our hearts. And in order to have the kingdom of God come out into the world, those of us who are believers have to do the work to get it from our hearts to the outside amongst other people. But really, that's a lot of work. I think what the disciples did in the early days of the church is they, when they realized that Jesus had been raised, they said, oh, what's obviously going to happen in this kingdom of God is that Jesus is going to take up his role as king, and then we get to be followers and just drive along in the bus. I think there are many Christians today who would prefer to be passengers in the bus than do the hard work of dealing with the injustice and the imperfections of this world today. Passengers on the Jesus bus. Doesn't that sound like a great place to go? I should write a song. Now, I think that those of us in the United Church have, most of us who have come here, are actually fairly comfortable with that work I'm talking about. We understand ourselves as being in the social justice movement, and we believe that the work of a Christian is to go out there and make the world a better place. There are many ways of expressing that. Um, but our passion is to bring that kingdom of God. Uh, some people don't like the word kingdom. If you prefer community or kingdom, that works too. But the whole idea is the vision of Jesus where all are equal and where justice is, is a reality. That's what we're working for real hard, and we're comfortable with that. That is our comfort zone. I think we're a lot less comfortable with the idea that the end point of Christianity is to discard these earthly bodies and get to go on to a new reality. And we're even less comfortable, I think, with the notion that we're going to have to stand for judgment in front of our Lord Jesus Christ. When we read these things from Paul, they feel very alien to our experience. It feels culty, uncomfortably close to those cults which you may have heard about where the believers come under the sway of a leader who says the world is going to end or an alien spaceship is going to come down and take all the believers away. All you have to do is just sell all your belongings to me at a discount price. I'll help you out with that. And we have some right to be uncomfortable with those kinds of ideas. But I think one of the problems is in our discomfort, we refuse to look at the parts of Paul that are of value. And our discomfort is sapping our confidence as believers. I'm going to reject Paul's prejudices and biases as a part of the first century community that he lived in. To be best left in the first century while we, with 2,000 years of better knowledge about how these things go, will work on justice as we understand it in our 21st century context. But what I don't want to leave behind of Paul was his passion, his enthusiasm, and his confidence in what he was doing. He really believed in Jesus' message, as do I. And even though we don't agree exactly on how that, how that message is going to be received or what exactly our work is to, is to be doing or what our cultural norms are as we are doing it, none of that matters because Jesus' message is robust enough to last the ages. And a kind of missionary zeal to be getting across our vision of a world where there is justice for all. I think the world is in a place where it needs a little more of that kind of confidence. Not because we have all the answers. We are very unattractive as a church when we are sure we have all the answers. But because instead, Christianity suggests that we have some good questions. Like, Jesus gave us the right questions to ask. Like, who are we leaving out when we gather in our community? Or, how can we believe scientists and still be a person of faith? Or, how can I live in a society that makes me scared all the time and yet still believe in the power of love? 
These are all hard questions, and we don't have all the answers to them. But what we do have, as Paul says, is the ability to walk, and i got to say it right here, in my manuscript, the reason is that we can walk by faith and not by sight. Not because we're seeing all the realities that we're trying to work towards, but because we have faith that if we do the work, we will get there. And if we can't be confident in all of the things that we hope for, we can at least be confident that Jesus calls us ever forward to a world that is ever more just. I think with all the uncertainties that are going along in our world, our ability to ask good questions in faith that there are good answers somewhere down the road, our confidence to say that we don't have all the answers but we're willing to ask the questions, those things in the world we are living in matter more than they ever have. Ask your questions in confidence. Amen. Let us close in prayer. Eternal God, we come to you with hungry hearts waiting to be filled with a sense of your presence, with the touch of your spirit, with new energy for service. Come to us, we pray. Be with us. Touch us. Empower us as your people that we might worship you and act in the world for Jesus' sake. Amen. You shall go out with joy and be led forth with peace. The mountains and the hills will break forth before you. There'll be shouts of joy and all the trees of the field will clap, will clap their hands. And all the trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Will clap their hands. Will clap their hands. Will you go out with joy? You shall go out.